Amen. Good morning, church. Hope we're all doing good. So nice to see so many faces here on Easter Sunday. So thank you so much for making it out. It's so nice to actually see real people here in the church. It's so exciting. Um, I hope that you've had a great Easter weekend. Um, the sun has been shining all weekend. It's been such good weather. So hope that you've been able to enjoy a wee Easter egg or two out in the sun. Um, as I said, it's the Easter weekend this weekend, so on Good Friday, just there, we had the Bishop Briggs Churches Together service. Um, it was on Friday, and if you missed it, it's still up on YouTube, I believe, and it's only about 30 minutes long, um, and it was a great service to um, be with so many different churches. So if you missed it, then if you have a wee free a afternoon, a wee free half hour sometime this week, then definitely go and give it a watch. Along the same lines, we've got the Greater Glasgow United Easter service tonight at 6 p.m. on YouTube and on Facebook. So that'll be so nice to celebrate the resurrection together with loads of other churches all across Glasgow. So make sure you tune into that tonight at 6. However, today we have our pastor, David, continuing our I Am series and very fitting with Easter. He's going to be talking about I Am, the Resurrection and the Life. And I've just heard it in the earlier service and it was great. So you're in for a treat. <laughs> um, but that's all from me. So we're just going to get on with our Easter service. one of the twelve disciples went to the leading priest and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him thirty pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Jesus had supper with his twelve disciples. He told them to love one another as he loved them. Jesus took some bread he thanked God for it and broke it and shared it with his friends. When Jesus took a cup of wine, he thanked God for it and passed it to his disciples. Oh, it's a little towel. During the Passover meal, Jesus got up, took off his out of pose and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a large bowl and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you, and tell you the truth. Slaves are no greater than their master nor is messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you have done these things, God will bless you for doing them. After the Passover meal, Jesus went with his disciples to the garden to pray. When Jesus finished praying, Judas came to the garden with some soldiers 
this to Jesus and tied him up. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted. Hail, King of the Jews! The soldiers took Jesus to Golgotha to nail him to a cross. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, which was seamless woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfil scripture he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Yeah. I got it! I got it! A man named Joseph asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph wrapped the body in spices and strips of linen, then placed it in a new tomb cut out of the rock. A large stone. Joseph rolled a large stone in front of the entrance and went away. Later, the chief priests and Pharisees put a seal on the stone and posted some guards there. Then he rolled the great stone across the entrance and left. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said when he was not alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. Pilate replied, take the guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. On the third day after Jesus' crucifixion, the women brought spices to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. But they saw that the stone had rolled away, and the body of Jesus was not inside. An angel told them, Jesus is not here, he has risen from the dead. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your one and only son to sacrifice himself to save us. We want to celebrate his life for the rest of ours. We thank you for creating a new beginning and new hope for eternal life with you. Help us walk in that mighty grace and tell us your good news to all. Shine your light in us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and purpose. May all your plans succeed. In your name, Amen.
Para si. Para si. Para si. Good morning, church. It is so good to be here on Easter Sunday. Whether you're at home or whether you're in the church, let's stand as we worship together. Hi there, I am Ruth Alexander, um, known to many as Ruthie, but I'll answer to both. Um, I am a full-time mum to Noah, Caleb and Bonnie. Noah and Caleb are both eight years old and are in primary four at school. And yes, they are twins. And I have Bonnie, who is five, who is in primary one. Oh, I've also been married to Pete for 13 and a half years. Um, I was brought up in Bears Den and stayed there until I was 18 and when I moved through to Edinburgh. Uh, I was in Edinburgh for three years when I met Pete. Um, he was studying in Aberdeen at the time and so we decided to get married and then I moved to continue studying in Aberdeen and we lived in Aberdeen for four years. Uh, we moved back to Glasgow and we now currently live in Lindsay. Um, I trained as a staff nurse and worked until we had the boys and decided that I would be a full-time mum when they came along. It was always on our plan, but especially when we found out they were twins, thought better that I stop work and be there for them, um, which has been very rewarding. I've enjoyed and loved being a full-time mum. It's had its ups and downs too, but who hasn't? I... I'm currently studying to be a classroom assistant, support for learning assistant um, at Glasgow Kelvin College, which is interesting. I've been doing it through teams um, and yeah, it's actually better because of childcare. Um, so I've enjoyed that, but it has been full on, but it'll be worth it. Hopefully come August, I will be able to get a job within a primary school and yeah. One particular moment 
uh, when I truly experience Jesus, his presence, um, his comfort and his love. Like I said before, was it when Bonnie was in um, ICU when she was three months old? She got a bad case of bronchiolitis and she had to be admitted to the hospital. I found that very hard. Um, I was really, I was lost. I was a mess. I had two, two three year olds at home who just started nursery, who also just had a new baby brought into their lives to then suddenly mummy or baby not being about. And I had this little bundle just lying in the bed with tubes in her, with machines connected to her. And I just felt completely and utterly out of control. And thankfully my mother-in-law came down from Inverness to look after the boys as long as we needed her to do that and that was great because the boys had a constant um, adult figure in their lives because Pete was coming and going and I was obviously never home because I was in the hospital. That week felt like a year. Um, I felt helpless that I couldn't be there for the boys and at the same time I couldn't fight this infection for Bonnie. Even though humanly everything seemed um, impossible, I actually pictured it like a balloon one of these buildings that are conf they're filled with confetti. And I just pictured it getting popped at that time and the confetti just going everywhere and just landing everywhere and being everywhere. And I just felt I had to be in 10 places at once. And I couldn't, I couldn't leave my sick baby alone to go and see my boys. Thankfully, Pete did bring them up some nights to see us, well, to see me in the hospital. And I couldn't heal Bonnie. And through that time, I knew someone who could. Jesus, Jesus could. Jesus was with me at the darkest and hardest of times. He was with my boys, who were great, actually. They were happy. They were excited to have Granny Mother here. They had nursery. They had their clubs. They, they were fine, just obviously a bit confused about what was happening. Jesus was with Pete, because Pete was obviously going through this at the same time. And he was with that little bundle on this big adult bed. She wasn't even in an incubator. She was on this big adult bed, propped up, sound asleep. But she was full of all these wee tubes and things that, yeah, it's not a nice sight to see your child connected to machines, but it helped her. Um, she pulled through. She pulled through as quickly as she fell ill. Um, and she was back on the normal ward, happy as Larry, and we managed to get her home um, not too long after. Through that time, even during that time and looking back, Jesus had me, Jesus held me. He healed her, he healed Bonnie, he comforted me, and he just showed me in the endless love that he has for us in any situation. Thanks for thanks to so much prayer from friends and family and their church family. Um, when I think about it, I actually just felt and feel peace over the whole situation. Um, he reminded me that he had risen for a reason, and that reason was for you and me. And I still believe I still hold on on to that, and obviously I do believe it, and I hold on to that that time five years ago um, and throughout all that commotion I felt closer to Jesus than I've ever felt um, through my life and I've had my ups and fair ups and downs as we all have but yeah that was one that's one moment that really stands out to me that Jesus was so present and so there and even though I felt so helpless I knew Bonnie would be fine I knew the boys would be fine I knew Pete would be fine and it's all thanks to him placing that peace and that love upon us. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be able to share with you this morning. Uh, my first Sunday as pastor at Woods Hill when I actually get to look out and see a congregation full of people. And so thank you so much for being here and for being with us online as well. And what better way uh, for me to start 
than to be able to declare the most important uh, truth of, of world history, the most significant truth for your life and for my life, which is that Jesus Christ is alive. It's so good to be able to come together to celebrate that fact. It's the truth that brings uh, transformation into lives. It's, it's the truth that brings hope uh, into our world. And so as millions come together today and over this week um, to fix their eyes upon Jesus and to think, about the, um, to think about the story of Easter, it's great to be able to, to declare that together today. All through this week, there are churches across the world celebrating this transformative message of the Easter story. And we get to celebrate again this evening online with um, churches from across Greater Glasgow. And uh, on Friday night, we join together with churches from across Bishop Briggs as well um, to, to think on Good Friday. And I only had a few minutes to share during that service, but I started off by um, telling them about my hometown in, in Paisley and a story from when I was growing up, uh, which was that um, I remember when Paisley, uh, in Paisley, sorry, we had um, the day that St. Mirren were finally promoted to the dizzy heights of the Scottish Premier League. And I was reflecting not on how the players felt or how the coach felt or how the manager uh, felt, but I was reflecting on how the, the supporters responded to that, how the followers of the football team responded on that day. And it's a familiar sight to most of us, but many of the fans were getting a bit carried away. They were celebrating as if they themselves were solely responsible for the victory. There was cheering, there was singing, there were fireworks, there was a parade in the street. There were some very ill-advised tattoos uh, getting done. And the, the followers were doing that common thing of, of not saying St. Mirren won, they weren't saying uh, they won, they weren't saying my team won, they were saying we won. We won the victory, we won um, the league, we are being promoted. And there were some fans who, to put it very nicely, didn't quite have the physique of professional football players. But they were suddenly taking credit, or so it seemed, taking credit for a sporting achievement. And after all the sacrifice of the players, they were saying, we won, we are the champions. And despite the fact they had very little to do, to do with it, they could claim a victory for themselves. And they could lay hold of that victory for themselves because it had been won for them and won on their behalf. And I've, I've been using that illustration, I guess, this weekend because it, when it comes to why I can celebrate this Easter and why each one of us can celebrate this Easter, it's a pretty fitting description, at least of myself. In, in kind of spiritual terms, I'm, I'm pretty well described um, spiritually by that comparison of a pie-eating uh, St. Mirren uh, supporter. When it comes to Easter, people will be able to look at me and say, what gives him the right to celebrate in this way? What makes him so special? Why can he claim that victory and sing and celebrate? They could quite legitimately ask that question. What gives them the right to do that? And the amazing truth is what we celebrate today is that Christ has won the ultimate victory and I get to be a part of that. I get to lay hold of that and each one of us gets to lay, lay hold of that too. See, Christianity is not just a matter of saying, I believe that Jesus uh, lived and I believe Jesus died and, uh, and suffered and uh, you know, he rose again. But actually, there are two important words that are for me. He did this for me. He lived for me. He suffered for me. He died for me. He rose again for me. And that's the important uh, distinction that we need to make when we come to this uh, Easter. See, as we come to our passage of Scripture for today, we're going to see that Jesus being alive brings life to us. And Jesus' resurrection is what brings hope for us today. As a church, we've been looking at the I am statements of Jesus Christ, which we find all through the Gospel of John. We've been looking at a different one each week, and we've seen how um, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and bringing full satisfaction to us. We've seen how Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And really he's saying, I'm the one who knows you by name, and I'm the one who protects you. And we've looked at how Jesus said, I am the light of the world, the one who we can follow, the one who, get, who guides us in the darkest of times. Last week, we looked at how Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And today we're going to be focusing on John chapter 11. If you've got a Bible, if you've got a Bible on your phone, you feel, feel free to look it up. It'll also be on the screen as well. We're going to focus on John chapter 11, where we find the next of our I Am statements. And we're going to focus in on one conversation that Jesus had uh, with a woman called Martha. And I want us to try and put ourselves into Martha's shoes today. We're going to pick up the story in chapter 11, verse 17. But first, let me just fill you in on a couple of, of things, give you a wee bit of background, what's going on here. Jesus had three good friends. Their names were Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And they were siblings, and they lived in the town of Bethany. And Lazarus had fallen very ill. He was at the point of death. And so Mary and Martha had sent a message to Jesus to say, the one whom you love is ill. But, but Jesus didn't go to them. Despite the fact that he loved them, he stayed where he was for, for days until Lazarus had died. And then he decided to go to Bethany when it was too late, when all hope seemed to be lost. By the time Jesus got to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. It says in the, the King James Version, it talks about how he started to, to smell. In the, in the King James Version, it says, his body stinketh. <laughs> and so it had really become too late. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 17. It says, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's a familiar kind of train of thought. We see it actually, if we skip down a few verses, we come to verse 32, we find Mary saying the exact same thing. You see it on the screen, verse 32, it says, Now when Mary came to Jesus, to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Then comes the shortest verse in the Bible, which just says, and Jesus wept. I think many of us could probably relate to the cry of Mary and Martha in this story. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, they said. You too may have had moments when you thought, if only if only God would turn this around, if only God would transform this situation, if only God would show up. If you've been around someone who's nearing the point of death, particularly, and caring for them and praying for them as Mary and Martha were, you'll be able to relate to this story. See, in their pain and in their sorrow, each day they were hoping that something would change, that they would turn a corner, that the person would get back on their feet again. And to some degree, we've all been kind of in that situation in the, the shoes of Mary and Martha this year. I'm quite an optimistic person. So when we first went into lockdown, I was thinking to myself, ah, it won't be that long until we're out of lockdown. It'll just be a few weeks or maybe a month. And people were saying to me, no, it'll be a lot longer than that. And I said, no, it will be done by Easter 2020, I thought. And, and then I thought, well, you know, we're done by summer. We'll be done by, and I kept on saying, we'll be done by then. We'll be done by then. But, um, but obviously we weren't. And with each milestone that's passed, we've been asking this question. Many of us have been asking this question. When is it going to change? What is God doing here? Is there any reason to hope, to look to the future with hope? And each day that's passed, we've become more and more used to hearing the death toll given on our TVs and hearing of how many people have died that day. And, and each Number is another life lost and another, another family left devastated. And so Mary and Martha, similarly, all around them, people are crying, people are mourning this death. And just in case you've ever felt as if, you know, I shouldn't be so upset, I shouldn't have these tears, um, I shouldn't feel so much pain, 
Some people will look at it and think, you know, it must be a lack of faith for me to feel so bad. Just in case you've ever worried that you need to pretend that everything is fine. Not only does Jesus in this story meet them in their despair, but do you see he actually, he mourns with them. He's not mourning for, for Lazarus because he knows what's going to happen to Lazarus. He knows how the story ends, but for these individuals that are surrounding him, he looks at them and he starts to weep with them, to mourn with them. He weeps alongside them. He feels their pain. He sees a world that's entangled in sorrow and despair. In 1 Corinthians, there's a passage that talks about uh, death being like the final and ultimate enemy. And Christ sees the devastation in this story. He sees the devastation that the enemy of death has caused. That it's caused Mary and Martha, that it's caused you, that it's caused me. Uh, and in this passage, he says, he was deeply moved and troubled in his spirit. That means he was upset, but also means there was a certain degree of anger. The way it's written showed that there was a certain degree of, and he was almost indignant at death and what death had done. Angry at so much in the world which was wrong that's not as it should be, both then and now. And then he weeps with them. I was speaking to Mark Hutchison this week, and he just had a throwaway comment about, you know, it's dangerous when people say in church that they're fine, because we always, need, we always feel like we need to say that we're fine. And we always have to, you know, feel like we need to bottle things up inside us. But the Bible is so clear, encouraging us that when it's appropriate, we should grieve. But, but there are two ways, there are two ways to grieve. There's a hopeless grief and there's a hopeful grief. You see, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we see this passage uh, where it comes along and Paul says that we have not to grieve as those who have no hope. It says, do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And then it tells us why. It's because of Easter. It says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. See, there's a hopeful grief that a Christian can have in the face of loss, in the face of adversity, in the face of pain and worry. And it's not based on optimism. It's not based on wishful thinking. It's based solidly in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Everyone around Jesus at that moment was crying and was hopeless and was saying, if only everyone except for Martha. That's why we're focusing on Martha today. You see, I actually, I cut off Martha kind of mid-thought. She was in the middle of speaking when I stopped reading what she had to say. So if we come back to verse 21, you'll see that she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. He's been dead for four days. But even now, I know that there is hope in you. Everyone else is saying, if only, but Martha is starting to learn how to say, if Jesus. See, if I read from verse 23, Jesus then says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She either doesn't understand what Christ is fully saying or she doesn't dare to hope. Martha takes Christ's words and she applies them to the distant future. She says, I know that one day he'll rise again. She doesn't dare to believe that this hope could make a difference to her present reality. She says, I know that one day there'll be a resurrection. But in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You see, eternal life is not just something which is merely for the, the future. It's not something which can uh, begin, sorry, it's something which can begin now, today. Because what we celebrate today is that that last enemy called death has been finally defeated in Jesus Christ. That's why we can have hope today. That's why in Revelation chapter 1, 
Jesus is seen there and he comes to John again and he says, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and the grave. My favorite lecturer at Bible college was a man named uh, Ted Herbert and he lived just over in Bears Den, not too far from here. And he was dying of an, an aggressive cancer. And shortly before his death, he, he came to the college and he spoke and he said goodbye and he, he preached for the last time. And the place was just filled with a grief, but a hopeful grief as he, as he shared from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where Paul writes about the attitude we can have towards death. You'll see it on the screen behind me in a second, but it says death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Jesus, our Lord. See, this is the victory we can declare this Easter morning, that death is defeated, that Jesus lives, and because he lives, we can live too. And despite the difficulties of the last year, despite the grief of physical death, we know that it doesn't disturb eternal life in Jesus Christ. So we don't lose heart. That's what Second Corinthians chapter 4 says next. It says, so we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen will soon be gone, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, in this moment of fear and grief and pain and confusion and death, Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. And he doesn't just say, I will be resurrected to new life. He doesn't just say, I will cause resurrection and life. Although that would still be an incredible statement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. To get close to Jesus is to get close to life itself. Life beginning now, not just in the distant future. That's why we've traditionally talked about people when they come to faith being born again. Because it's coming to a new life. That's why when people get baptized here at the church, they, that's what it symbolizes. The fact that they are dying to their old self and they are living anew in Jesus Christ. That's how my 13-year-old um, nephew was speaking about this church. Actually, he, he recognized this building and he said, I went there when, um, when the Haven were taking a service there. So the Haven is in Kilmacomb and there were they were taking a service and there was drug addicts who came, people who had struggled with drug addiction their whole lives and alcohol abuse. And, and they came and one by one they testified. He told me how they said that they'd been transformed and they'd come to a new life in Jesus Christ. And that's the difference that it makes. It brings new life for us today. And so in this story, Jesus encourages Martha to keep on swapping that if only for if Jesus he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her a question. And he asks us the same question as well. He says, do you believe this? And he's not asking purely in an intellectual way. He's not saying, do you believe that hypothetically one day, far in the future, this will be the case? He's asking, are you going to put your trust in me today? Are you going to ho lay hold of this victory that I've won for you and walk in it today? Martha replies with the reply that I pray that we would each give as well. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Just on Tuesday, we had someone connected to our fellowship who lost their earthly life. And that's, of course, that's of course led to uh, grief for that person's family and for their friends. But it's a hopeful grief. 
Because just the day before, they gave that response to Jesus. They accepted Jesus into their lives just the day before. And that changes everything. Billy Graham, he was a, a great, famous preacher um, who died a couple of years ago. Billy Graham, he once said when he was alive, he said, one day you will hear that Billy Graham has died. Don't believe a word of it, he said. At that time, on that day, I will be more alive than I have ever been. See, that's the truth that we celebrate today, that physical death, biological death is not the end, but that we can be assured of eternal, real, everlasting, eternal life. The Canadian scientist, G.B. Hardy, he said it really well. He, he was going through um, a process of looking into faith and challenging himself about, you know, is there an afterlife? Is, is there a God? And, and he said, when I looked at religion, I had two questions that I wanted answered. The first was, has anybody ever conquered death? And the second question was, if they have conquered death, have they made a way for me to do the same? He said, I checked the tomb of Buddha and it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Confucius, it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Muhammad and it was occupied. And then I came to the tomb of Jesus Christ and it was empty. And I said, there is one who conquered death. And then I asked the second question, he said, did he make a way for me to do it too? And I opened the Bible and discovered that he said, because I live, you can live also. That's the victory that we celebrate today. Jesus is alive and in him we can live also. And this is the question we need to ask ourselves, the one that Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe in him? At times we may feel like Martha struggling to find hope. But if you read on in this story, you'll find that Christ brings life and hope into this world, into this situation. But it all started for Martha with this conversation that she had with Jesus. It all starts with when she saw Jesus coming into the little town of Bethany and she realized because Jesus has come, hope has come as well. And this truth is summed up perfectly for us in the song that we're about to watch and listen to. It's a, a song performed by our choir here, the Inspire Choir here in the church, and it's called Hope is Here. And just before we watch it, let's just pray together and thank our Heavenly Father that because of Jesus Christ, hope is here. Hope has arrived, and we can walk in that hope and walk in that victory today. Let's pray, and then we'll watch, and then we'll listen and watch this song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Easter message. We thank you for all that you have done in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is the resurrection and the life. And thank you that through him, we can have hope. Lord, that we can know you close to us. As Ruthie was saying earlier, as she shared about her, her experience, Lord, thank you that you are able to draw alongside us and to be close to us. Thank you that you have won the victory for us and we can lay hold of it in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the life. We thank you for the hope that you give us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus is here.